Hello, everyone. Uh, this is another episode of Unisoft Law YouTube show where I interview amazing professionals, really interesting people from mostly Toronto, uh, Toronto area at the moment, hoping to uh, talk to people outside of the GTA. I'm a commercial litigator here in Toronto. My name is Pulat Unisoft with Unisoft Law Professional Corporation. I do it mostly to satisfy my own curiosity and I hope you share my curiosity and enjoy these interviews. So today we have a, a really interesting guest for many reasons uh, that will become apparent as we talk. His name is Michael Sage and he is a lawyer um, here in Ontario in the Toronto area. And uh, I follow Michael on Twitter and he's also a venture of the Law Society. I will let uh, Mike uh, take over. I hope it's okay if I call you Mike, by the way. <laughs> oh, uh, well, that's, uh, that, that's certainly fine. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. All right. Mike, uh, you know, um, of course, the first question that comes to mind, it, it, the first issue that comes to mind is I've never interviewed a bencher before, like a real live bencher. Tell me the bencher story. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's certainly kind of an interesting story. I, I first ran uh, for Bencher in 2015, and uh, I, I got I I really wasn't very familiar with the uh, you know with with the Law Society at that point. I, I got an email from the Law Society uh, that mentioned the upcoming Bencher election. So naturally, I, I understood they were asking me specifically to run. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I, I, I responded, I took up the mantle. Uh, I said in 2015, you know, guys, let's, uh, let's try to push the court system uh, for e-filing. Uh, you know, I like my horse, I like my process server's horse, uh, but I, I don't think we need them anymore to, uh, to, to walk documents to court. And so I came, I came really close that time. And then I ran again last year and uh, did a little bit better. I, well, I came 21st the first time I ran, and I was able to come 18th uh, last year, and uh, so was recently elected as a bencher with the uh, Law Society. So when were you elected as a bencher, Mark? Uh, would have been actually a couple, a couple months ago with uh, Ms. Donnelly's, uh, I guess, election to treasurer. That freed up a, uh, a spot uh, that was not, I guess, protected for people in the different regions. And that's when I was elected. Okay, so you've been a bencher for about a couple of months now. Yeah, uh, correct. All right, so do you have some idea about who voted for you? Do you have like a profile or, or some information about that? The only real information I have is from the uh, from the feedback that I received during the campaign. Uh, certainly, I, I think I got a lot of support from uh, the pri private bar, uh, the, you know, to which I belong. Uh, but within that bar, my support seemed to be very, very diverse, uh, ranging from sole practitioners to people at small firms, people running small and mid-sized firms. And to my, to my somewhat surprise, uh, a number of the uh, you know, partners at large firms uh, supported my candidacy as well. So I really do think it, I, I, had, I drew support from a pretty broad cross-section, uh, certainly of the, of the private bar, as well as I guess lawyers who have you know, family, friends, or sympathies for those of us uh, in the private bar. Right. Well, but you'd, you, you, you'd, you'd agree with me that you're not really a household name in the legal community here in Ontario. Uh, and I uh, hadn't heard of you before I met you in person. Uh, we'll, we can talk about that later. Uh, what do you think explains your success as, as a relatively unknown uh, litigator from uh, the Toronto area, from Hamilton, correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah, uh, well, I, I practice all across the, uh, across the GTA. Um, my last uh, court trial, believe it or not, was Peterborough, uh, and you know, just uh, just kind of the way things uh, things worked out. Uh, but I think a lot of my campaign was just I took my message directly to to, uh, to lawyers. I uh, was able to leverage technology uh, to uh, you know send a lot of emails 
uh, mm -hmm. to uh, lawyers all across Ontario with my message. I, I tried to make my messages short and somewhat, uh, you know, I, I guess on point and also catchy. And I know from some of the responses I got that people who didn't receive them, they would forward them to their friends. Uh, you know, probably my most famous email uh, asked whether the Law Society should own a private jet. Uh, because when you've got a yearly budget of 140 million, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of money there. You're, you're not constrained with normal people problems anymore. Well, we just uh, lifted the veil a little bit on what your message was, but I'm, I'm curious, what message was, uh, was, was there? What message did you send to, through your campaign? What was your platform? Yeah, so it's a great question. So I, I think at the end of the day, the platform largely came down to a you know, dollars and cents platform. Uh, there's a lot of challenges facing lawyers in private practice. Uh, whether it's finding clients with the ability to pay, uh, which is probably, you know, a, a paramount one for a lot of lawyers, uh, you know, whether they are paid directly by the clients or previously by legal aid, uh, who's seen their budgets, obviously, obviously chopped. Um, so I really focused on that. And I think there's a lot of issues, uh, you know, that affect those lawyers, including law society fees that are some of the highest in North America. Uh, I think that's a problem, and uh, you know that that's certainly something that I continue to push to have addressed. Did your American experience help you in any way in your political campaigning? We know how, uh, uh, let's say, good they are at political campaigning. Yeah, I, I I think my time in the U.S. was invaluable for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, one of the one of the chief reasons is. You know, if, if when you started driving, you had only ever, you know, driven a Yugo or a Lada, and, you know, you'd only ever seen those types of cars, you might, you know, you might have figured, well, sure, you know, it breaks down every three, three kilometers. Uh, it needs, you know, five liters of gas for those three kilometers. It's expensive to fix. The heater doesn't work. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it gets me from point A to point B, so it's serving its purpose. So you might not realize that, you know, the Yugo or the Lada is not actually a good automobile, especially in comparison to something like Tesla. And so coming from the American system, uh, you know, where when I left in 2011, almost everything was already filed electronically. Uh, you know, I didn't have to pay to have documents submitted to the court, uh, you know, for a process server to get on their horse and walk them there. Um, you know, uh, so it was just a new, new experience for me. And, you know, it really kind of reminded me of that Yugo or the Lada, you know, what is it we're doing here and why are we doing it? Why are we letting the Americans beat us like this? And, you know, candidly, I, I, I'm somewhat competitive, uh, you know, being a litigator, I guess that comes somewhat naturally. Uh, so I, I don't like to see the Americans beating us at the easy stuff. And so that's something that always annoyed me. Well, you talked about uh, Americans in third person. I assume you're originally from Canada then. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I'm originally a Canadian. Uh, I, I went down to the States for, uh, for law school and I worked down there for about five years. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, I came back a little after their housing bubble burst uh, because at, at, certainly at that point, the, uh, the pastures were quite a bit greener here in, in Ontario and Canada, which was still riding pretty high on the commodities boom. You finished your undergrad at Western in 2003. Uh, what's your story after that? How did you get into law school? <laughs> so, and why, why that law school? Tell us which one. Yeah, so great, uh, great, great question. So um, basically after, after undergrad, I wasn't able to uh, you know, secure a position that I thought had a, uh, you know, had, certainly it wasn't one that was taking me where I wanted to go. Uh, I had an economics degree. I, I wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't hired by any of the banks or investment companies. And uh, so I started looking at options uh, and uh, law was certainly something that, you know, probably true of a lot of lawyers, it was available. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I knew um, I, I'm not much of a student uh, in, in terms of, you know, I just 
don't really enjoy the whole school experience uh, other than other than test time perhaps and uh, so I, I you know look they had a wonderful tool in the states uh, it's the, where you could enter your GPA and enter your LSAT score uh, which you could then cross-reference with the U.S. News and World Reports uh, rankings of law schools and get a good idea as to the best uh, you know best school yeah. you have a chance to get into and so that's how I ended up at uh, the University of Pittsburgh. University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, PA, correct? Yeah, uh, correct. That's right. Uh, how was it? Was it? I don't know if you're familiar with Canadian law schools uh, since you went to an American one. But if you are, how was it different from Canadian law schools? Uh, so obviously, I, I don't have a lot of experience with Canadian law schools. Uh, certainly, in comparison to my undergrad. Um, it was, you know, to, in many respects, just on a different level, um, you know, just in terms of the resources available to a state school like that, um, their, their athletic facility, you know, one of them that had their basketball team, they'd spent something like 140 million on it at the time, uh, you know, blasting it into the side of that hill as, as you're familiar, because I believe you went to Pittsburgh as well. Um, you know, the, uh, a lot of my professors were from Harvard or Yale, uh, or certainly, you know, in a lot of cases, probably the top six U.S. law schools. Uh, some of the, you know, certainly some of the brightest professors I've, I've ever been in front of. And, uh, you know, the sections were generally 80 people, but the small sections were 20. And I, I really do credit my legal writing teacher uh, for making me a much, much better writer uh, in all respects. So, uh, you know, I, I certainly think quite highly of the, uh, the educational experience uh, that was offered. Full disclosure, I did go to University of Pittsburgh for my graduate school. I went to Osgoode Hall Law School for my law school. I really enjoyed my time in Pittsburgh and uh, I, I go back every once in a while. It's a great little town. Uh, what about the Socratic method? You know, the, uh, I don't know if you saw the movie called Paper Chase. Uh, it's about uh, 1L at Harvard. Yeah. And I, I, I guess you know what Socratic, Socratic method is. We don't use it. We didn't use it at, at Osgood. I don't think they use it in Canadian law schools. What about uh, Pitt? Yeah, so Pitt was full Socratic method. And in, in my view, it's about the least effective way to teach something. Um, you know, it, 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 you know, I, I guess a simple example is, you know, to teach someone about your shirt, you might start out off with, you know, well, it, it's not a car. Well, okay, you know, is it a boat? Is it a plane? Well, you know, it's not a vehicle. Okay, is it a person? Is it a place? Is it a thing? And uh, so, you know, and obviously a lot of what happens in law school, when you really break, break it down and strip away a lot of the fancy words, um, they're basically giving us cookie recipes. Uh, you know, there's a recipe for breach of contract. It involves, you know, a legally enforceable agreement that's breached that causes damages. And, uh, you know, certainly I think that my example I just gave you is a much more effective way to communicate that to someone perhaps than the Socratic method. Mm -hmm. All right, very interesting. So after law school at Pitt, I'm looking at your LinkedIn profile, uh, I, and I noticed that you went to the unofficial Canadian province of Florida. <laughs> so <laughs> tell us that story. Yeah, so, um, you know, basically, I, I obviously, my, my background's economics. I, at that time, thought I was going to move and reside in the U.S. permanently. And so I went to, uh, I actually was able to finish my law school uh, with a course at the University of Miami, uh, which is a ph phenomenal place to do three credit hours over one semester. Uh, so I enjoyed my time there immensely. Uh, and, I, I love Miami. I, I love that city. Yeah, and if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend you check out the university. Um, in my view, it's everything you know a school university campus should be. Uh, they have a nice, beautiful lake in the center of campus. Off the center of campus, they have the student center. Uh, they have a nice student pool around there. Then you've got some of the other, you know, important buildings, the athletic facilities, the one, one or more of the student bars. 
and then kind of tucked away, you know, around the unimportant stuff like the parking lots. You have some of the academic buildings, uh, which at the time I had much, much less interest in. Mm -hmm. And uh, you uh, finished that course at the University of Miami, right? Well, yeah, I, I, that was just my last semester. I still graduated from Pittsburgh and then yeah. I took the, uh, took the Florida bar and uh -huh. uh, managed to uh, manage to lock into a, uh, a job at a very well-respected regional law firm there uh, where I worked for just under five years, uh, you know, doing, doing litigation, uh, primarily some commercial litigation, insurance coverage and personal injury. How is American litigation practice different from Canadian litigation practice? I'm specifically interested in whether you got to do any trials and what kind of trials in your first five years of practice in the US. Yeah, so American litigation practice, I, I simply describe it as elbows up, uh, you know, just, just from the old hockey analogy. Uh, there are effectively no rules of civility uh, and, uh, you know, my first trial was about five months out and I would have had my first jury trial, you know, several years out. Uh, my, 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 uh, firm essentially gave me great responsibility and said, you know, here, Mike, uh, there's a jury trial to do. Uh, you know, uh, you, you've seen one before now do it yourself. And, uh, you know, it's also a slightly different procedure in that you write the jury instructions. Uh, you do a full void dire of the, of the jury beforehand. And then essentially you have, you know, something that's roughly equivalent to what a Canadian trial would be. And uh, you mentioned that there, is, there are no rules of civility. What did, what did you mean by that? Yeah, so um, there, there certainly, in, in the U.S., in law, like many things, uh, the important outcome is simply winning, and the, that's what the system rewards, and the system doesn't necessarily penalize however you, however you get there. And so a story that I remember part of uh, that, that illustrates this in, in terms of just how far things go in the States is there were actually two law firms in, in Tampa a few years ago that were in trial and they hated each other. And uh, you can actually find this on Google. And so the one, uh, the one firm found out where the other firm was going after, after trial each day in terms of food and drinks. And so sure enough, one day, one of the partners was over at that, at that bar after trial and he was up at the bar ordering a drink, and you know he just so happened to catch the eye of a pretty attractive woman, who uh, who took an interest in him, and so they they're, they're talking for a little bit, and you know thing one thing leads to another, and all of a sudden she has to leave, uh, because you know her car is in a parking lot just across the street, and uh, she has to move the car from the parking lot, uh, but you know if he was able to move this car for her. Uh, then, then of course she'd be able to stay. And so this lawyer, you know, he, he's a gentleman. He sees how well things are going. So he uh, he leaves from the bar. He gets her keys. He gets in her car. He pulls onto the street. And as soon as he does, he's pulled over by the sheriff and arrested for DUI. And so it later came back that this, uh, you know, the, the other firm had basically set this whole thing in play with, you know, both the sheriff as well as with a female employee of their office just to try to get an advantage of trial. And that actually did lead to some disbarments. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's just an example of, you know, in the States, um, you know, the, the, the whole, whole point of it is simply to win. And uh, there are very limited penalties for, you know, for mm. going to any means to do so. All right. Why did you come back to Canada? So did you trade technological uh, uh, um, uh, progress, but lack of civility for a civil but technologically backward jurisdiction? So well, I'd love to say I did, uh, but uh, one of the, one of the, you know, candidly, the job prospects, especially for relatively young associates were much better in Ontario at the time. Uh, the U.S. has a huge glut of lawyers. They, they graduate about 45 to 50,000 a year, and there's only a need 
uh, for about 25,000 of those in terms of positions that require a law degree. Uh, so the working conditions for a lot of associates, generally speaking, are not great uh, in terms of either income or benefits uh, or even number of work hours, because when you have that sort of surplus, uh, you know, I guess a little bit like our articling crisis, all of the cards are held by the employers and, uh, you know, none of them are held by the associates. And, you know, certainly I was looking at what I was doing and, you know, working where I was would, or, or even, you know, uh, laterally would not have allowed me to achieve my financial goals and being in the U.S. generally one serious accident and uh, I'm bankrupt. So, uh, you know, certainly that, uh, and I couldn't start my own firm. Uh, so all of those things together, uh, you know, certainly encouraged me to come back. When you mentioned uh, a serious accident, were you talking about health insurance? Yeah, uh, you know, basically in, in the US, uh, obviously everything is private health insurance. Uh, health insurance plans typically have, you know, some combination of co-pays and deductibles. And, uh, you know, if you end up in a, you know, if you're in a very serious accident and in the hospital for a few weeks, in an increasing number of cases, you can exceed the policy limits. Uh, you know, you, if you have a million dollars in coverage, maybe you end up, you know, owing 1.2 or 1.3 million. And, uh, you know, at that point in time, you declare bankruptcy and say, you know, life was, life was great. I, I just enjoyed this working, you know, for the last years, you know, six years so much for free that I'm willing to, you know, rinse and repeat the process, uh, which mm -hmm. didn't make a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So at some point uh, after you returned to Canada, uh, you worked here, but then at some point you started your own practice, didn't you? Uh, I, I did, and I, I, I had the best, uh, best possible reason for starting my own practice because uh, I got fired from the firm I was working at. Uh, and uh, so that, uh, that certainly gave me great impetus to, uh, to go out on my own, uh, especially at the time I found that there was not a big lineup of firms looking to hire someone with U.S. experience uh, who would recently been fired. Very interesting. Uh... What was your vision for your practice? Uh, you, perhaps you did it out of necessity, but uh, I'm sure that someone like you must have had some kind of vision or idea for his, uh, this new enterprise you were about to start. Yeah, it, it was certainly a combination of both. What I, what I really wanted is what, I, what I've largely built, is a boutique firm uh, that allows me to have a smaller number of clients uh, where I can dedicate, uh, you know, an increased amount of time to their files. And as, as you can probably tell, I, I like math, I like numbers, uh, and so I, and, and statistics. So if you have 2,000 hours in a work year and you have 200 clients, obviously you can dedicate about 10 hours per file per year uh, on average. And, uh, you know, it, obviously if you have 40 or 50 clients, you can dedicate substantially more time. So that, that was kind of the balance I was hoping to, hoping, to, hoping to achieve that I largely have over the last few years. In your own practice here in Ontario, can you think of a case that is your favorite, absolute favorite? You don't have to disclose, obviously, uh, identities or anything like that, but I think I would really be interested to hear about your favorite case. Um, so it's certainly a good question. A few of my favorite cases, I, I you know, they're, they're about to go to trial. Uh, so obviously I've got to, got to move down somewhat. Um, and, uh, you know, there, it, it's hard to name, certainly hard to name a favorite. I, I can tell you the most memorable. Uh, they're all your children. They're all your children. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I, I can tell you the most memorable was yeah. uh, you know, I was covering a uh, discovery for another colleague in my firm, and it was a family law act uh, discovery of the husband. Uh, the husband was not a particularly happy claimant, or I guess happy person, generally speaking, uh, did not really want to be part of the process. And uh, he, uh, he, he made that quite clear uh, relatively early on in the discovery, went after, you know, some of the introductory questions, you know, tell us your name, 
well, you know my name, um, you know, and, uh, you know, what's your relationship to, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the plaintiff? You know, I'm the husband. Why are you asking such stupid questions? Uh, you know, after, after a little bit of this at full volume, he was pretty much ready to uh, storm, you know, jump across the table. And uh, he, he stormed out of the discovery after, you know, swearing at the, uh, swearing at the defense lawyer. And I was just thankful that I didn't have to tackle him, uh, you know, before he uh, physically assaulted this defense lawyer and, you know, allowing her to get out of the room. So certainly that was the, uh, that was certainly the most, uh, most memorable. And that was in Ontario, not in the States. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was in, the, in, in Ontario here. I see. Interesting. So uh, I know that uh, you take particular interest in technology. Uh, obviously, you could, you could compare your American experience with the, uh, your experience in Ontario with respect to court filing. And uh, I know that you worked in jurisdictions with electronic filing. And you said that you didn't have to send the processor to the courthouse. But do you have any background in technology itself that uh, heightens your interest in uh, litigation tech? Uh, so uh, in terms of formal background, the answer would be no. Uh, but, you know, within the last few years, I've started to educate myself. There's, you know, phenomenal platforms out there like Coursera and edX. Uh, and uh, so I... Uh, last year, for instance, I finished uh, CS50, uh, the Harvard Introductory Computer Science course that's offered for free on, uh, on edX. Uh, I, I'm sure I spent much more time on it than a lot of their undergrads did for a number of reasons. But, uh, you know, it's just such a phenomenal, uh, you know, it, it's such a phenomenal, I guess, area at this point in time. And I think it's going to revolutionize not just this industry, but society. And, uh, you know, likewise, last year, uh, or I guess the year before, I'd attempted to build a document automation platform uh, for use in uh, specifically some of the higher volume firms. I wasn't able to find, uh, you know, I wasn't able to find, I guess, potential buyers for it, but I did get it up and running, uh, got it developed. And, uh, you know, certainly it was a phenomenal, developing software was phenomenally interesting, uh, you know, on a number of levels. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, Ontario is up to the American standard now on core technology, specifically with respect to filing? Um, well, so certainly not, uh, because we're trying to get now where they were 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, candidly, you know, a simple example would be if I want to file a document in the States, at below my signature line, I simply do a certificate of service saying I've served this. Although that was 10 years ago, they may have eliminated that because the, the electronic service automatically sends notification to everybody. Uh, and in Ontario, we've of course found a slower, more cumbersome way to accomplish the same thing by requiring a formal affidavit of service uh, and as well requiring that to be commissioned by someone different than the one who served it. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I would be very surprised if we have done in one month what the Americans have been working on in one year, or sorry, if, you know, for 10 years. Is your experience with uh, American court uh, filing uh, limited to Florida state courts, or you also had experience with U.S. federal courts? Uh, it was uh, state and federal in, in, state. in the state. So even, even the small county I was in of several hundred thousand people, uh, they had electronic filing 10 years ago. Okay, so what, uh, is, is, what is still remaining for Ontario to do to be up to par with, uh, with that particular jurisdiction on uh, online filing, for example, or other court technology? Well, I think, you know, one of the largest things is going to be they're just, I think they're getting much closer. I think they do still need to revise a number of the rules uh, just to recognize the role technology is playing. Uh, at some point in time, the court system, you know, will, will get a little bit better at realizing, you know, the plaintiff, for instance, is submitting documents one through 10, the defense is submitting documents 11 through 20, 
this is our universe of documents and I have seen we're kind of getting there with case lines. Um, and I think that we do need to take a look at, you know, if we're submitting documents electronically, do we still need to pull out these 17th century rules of evidence or 18th century rules of evidence? Or could we perhaps say that documents are presumptively admissible unless someone could identify a specific, uh, you know, specific objection to them? Um, so I think that's largely where we have to go. We're certainly doing much, much better now with Zoom. I know until recently, the court system had toyed with the idea of court call uh, because it was more cumbersome, more costly, and didn't work as well. And uh, thankfully, it sounds like that, uh, that proposal was defeated. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I heard you say something about electronic service in the US, where if I understand you correctly, there was a centralized court sanctioned system for service, not filing, which everybody understands, but service, which is actually harder to do, I think. Is, am I right? Yeah, uh, that, that's my rec recollection as to how PACER works, which is the, the U.S. system used by their federal court system. Right. Um, you, you simply file your documents and, you know, obviously if you're filing a statement of claim, personal service is still required. Uh, but after that, everyone, you know, needs to provide their email address. It's one of the, one of the foundational requirements. Uh, if you tell them, uh, you know, you'd like paper documents, they would probably tell you, you know, they'd like to be millionaires or billionaires, but it's not happening. Uh, so, uh, you know, basically that's the, straight uh, shooters. Americans are straight shooters. <laughs> exactly. So uh, case lines sounds like that. So everybody, basically, uh, there is no service anymore. There's only filing and it's up to parties to check on notifications from the filing system. And I, and I guess it's introductory because I know I filed through the Ontario, I guess just the regular filing portal, which has been expanded for other documents. And so that rejected a filing a few days ago until I made up an affidavit of service. Uh, and then obviously case lines, I've only used it in one case. And uh, you know, basically things were filed. Actually, I guess it wasn't even case lines. I guess it was sync, which was their-, their Yeah, sync. Uh, yeah, so case lines, I don't think anybody has used it uh, yet. Maybe somebody did uh, and uh, would love to hear from that person. But I understand that case lines is a hearing system. It's an electronic hearing system. Uh, and uh, it does not replace the court filing system. And this, this new online filing that we have in Ontario is a pure emulation of traditional conventional paper filing, except it's an electronic format. So you still have to file the affidavit of service with your no, uh, motion record, for example, and there is still uh, there is still approval by court staff. That's why I think it takes five days, right, to get up to five days to get your confirmation. So it's a pure emulation of our conventional court system, which I still incredibly thankful for, and I'm still reeling from the shock that it happened overnight. I mean, I know they worked on this behind the scenes for for some time, uh, but. Uh, it just happened, and uh, suddenly we were in a fairy tale land, right? It's it's shocking, but of course that's the human nature. Uh, we keep, uh, you know, we, we quickly get used to good things and we start looking for better things. So I think the next iteration of core technology would be something like Pacer, except way better because Pacer is backward in many ways, right? Yeah. Where, where parties essentially upload things, everybody gets a notification. This is how whole internet software works, right? This is how email works. Email is basically pacer. You upload things to Google and Google sends you a notification that you have an email. You go to your client and you download that email to your system. People may think that this is a direct connection. It's not, it's intermediated by, by, by a central party. So it's very interesting. And uh, I think people like you can make a huge contribution to our core technology because you were exposed to 
a different jurisdiction that has way more advanced core, core technology. This comparative advantage is absolutely necessary, I think, both to learn from them and to avoid their mistakes because Pacer is nowhere near perfect. I don't want our uh, courts to emulate Pacer. They can do way better. Uh, anyway, so sorry for this uh, uh, sh uh, spiel. Sometimes I, uh, I use this uh, platform <laughs> to, to make my own uh, statements, but uh, I'm just excited uh, because of talking to you because that, that really spurred some ideas in my head. I really appreciate that. What do you intend to do as a bencher to advance these noble uh, goals and values of promoting core technology and reforming the rules of civil procedure and reforming the rules of evidence? I wanna talk about that. That's the next big thing, I think. Yeah, so uh, great, uh, great question. So certainly as a venture, what I do have is a larger platform to bring these issues to the fore. Uh, but at the end of the day, it really depends on the profession actually saying, or the public saying, you know, it's time for a change. Uh, and obviously, we in Ontario, we, we have some pretty dubious stats in our court system. Uh, in, in terms of trial time, we're we're much closer to Pakistan in terms of how long it takes to get things to trial than we are to the US and the UK. You know, I will actually not be surprised that Pakistan is way better. <laughs> I know, for example, that Russia is, uh, has much faster justice. I don't know if it's fair justice. I'm not making any judgment, but I know I, I've heard that uh, it's much, 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 much faster, like days or weeks to trial or something like that. Uh, yeah, I, I, Ontario is really special in the world. Well, and I, I, I think that, uh, you know, you certainly make good points about Russia and the stats that I'm relying on are from the World Bank time to enforce contracts. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's looking, you know, basically it's an wow. apple to apples comparison. Uh, and certainly in my experience, the same holds true or actually, you know, probably personal injury has the slowest trial times uh, just because we you know, in Ontario, from a public policy standpoint, we really devalue, uh, I guess, the lives of personal injury victims. Uh, you know, I think the same is true to an extent that people in family law disputes, we just decide, you know, we're, we're not willing to dedicate the resources to have your matter tried in an efficient time, and we're not willing to put in place, uh, you know, appropriate procedures to see that happen. If you were the Ontario legislature, what is one change to the rules of evidence that you would make? Well, I think it's the one I gave you that, you know, and basically what comes into play in arbitration, uh, which is evidence is presumptively admissible, uh, you know, unless there's a specific reason for it to be excluded. And, you know, I think especially in bench trials, uh, if you want to draw something with a crayon and say this is, you know, admissible evidence, uh, at the end of the day, what is the harm of doing that in most cases? Are you really concerned that a judge is going to be fooled by your crayon drawing? You know, is that what the case is going to turn on? Well, of course, we're talking only about civil cases, and not criminal cases. The criminal world is entirely different and admissibility of evidence there is everything. But I'm not a criminal lawyer and nothing, of course, in these interviews are legal advice. Still, uh, you know that... Um, Small claims court does that. If you file your documents at, at least the last time I checked, you know, don't quote me on that, but uh, if you file your documents at least 30 days before trial, they are presumptively admitted. And then the judge uh, goes by weight of, of evidence, not by admissibility. And, yeah. and I, think, I think it just makes so much sense yeah, and it, it's the same in most arbitrations. Uh, I, I did a commercial arbitration on a multi-million dollar claim, uh, I guess a few months back, and we agreed essentially to those same rules and the arbitration went with four or five witnesses and one expert witness in less than two days. Uh, if we had to use the public court system for that, it would have been at least six days. And a large reason for that is simply the different rules of evidence and right. uh, you know the lawyers would have behaved differently and required formal proof on everything. What do you think uh, uh, the role of requests to admit is in situations like that? Can they help in uh, Superior Court? 
Um, well, at, at the end of the day, you know, is, is it a feasible, you know, workaround potentially depending on who your counsel is? And, you know, that, that's actually an interesting topic because for civil admissibility, as you know, uh, you basically have to satisfy two questions, one of which is authenticity of the document. And then number two, is it legally admissible, which typically requires an except, exception to the hearsay rule. And for whatever reason, our default request to admit only address authenticity. So you'd actually have to double double your questions to get to admissibility. And right. obviously it's dependent on the other counsel saying, you know, is it my is it my interest or my client's interest that I admit these now so that we have a more efficient trial? Or would it be better for my client if I don't admit these? And then I number one, I can bill a lot more. And number two, I can drive up the opposing side's bill substantially more. And you know, until we change those incentives, I, I don't think requests to admit are, you know, a good workaround. A better workaround is just saying we've got rules that work better in small claims court and arbitration. Uh, you know, let's uh, let let's let's apply them as well to superior court and uh, spend more time deciding things on the merits and less time, uh, you know, getting into esoteric uh, evidence, uh, you know, adventures. I can chat about practice and procedure forever. It really is fascinating and I'm not being facetious. I mean, it's really the meat of our work. Uh, and I think you gave a really great litigation tip right there with uh, your point about requests to admit. Unfortunately, we don't have all the time in the world. And uh, I want to say it's been my pleasure to talk to you and I look forward to hearing about your work as a bencher and about your successes uh, as a litigator. It is really a pleasure to know you and to uh, have the benefit of your experience and knowledge. I hope to have you back on my show someday. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, Paolo, I'm always happy to come back on. So just, uh, just let me know. And it's certainly been my pleasure to be here today. So thank you uh, very much for inviting me on the show. Thank you, Michael.